Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And anyone who has followed my show understands the spiritual and multidimensional aspects of the Jake Feinberg show. All musics are covered, coming directly from the musicians themselves. Black Dirt lives again today on my program because of Brent Midland. He was the multidimensional keyboardist who expanded the Grateful Dead sound. He quickly dropped the bar lines and was chasing Philip Lesh down one rabbit hole while Billy Kreutzman was dancing on a pin. My guest today is someone who knows Brent better than most, one of the most prolific lyricists in the Western world. He and Brent worked together because it was real as thunder, real as the sun shining. It's so very undefined. The last time I spoke with my guest, he was in Mobile Bay, Alabama. We talked about how Ram Dass was a snake oil salesman early in his career, the April Experiment, Bob Weir's angular chords, hanging with Neil Cassidy, and melting into a cube of LSD while watching Raga concert at Wesleyan. We didn't talk about his collaborator-in-chief, Brent Midland. By the time the album Built to Last came along, Brent had the most published songs on that album. He felt success real fast, and it shot him up and brought him back, and eventually underground. His spirit remains with me as it was in the late 90s when I was at Boston University. I had a chance to talk with my guest while he was giving a seminar on the internet at Harvard. We talked about Brent for 10 or 15 minutes, but over the years, I misplaced it. Lash the mast. John Perry Barlow, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Howdy, Jake. Happy birthday, Brent, man. Happy birthday, indeed. To think you're why. Yeah, go ahead. I wish you were here to celebrate it. Well, listen, you know, we got a, uh, a game on this program called, uh, it is Brent's birthday. We got a, a name, a game on this program called, uh, name that voice. I just want you to listen to the content of what this cat's talking about. And then we'll come back and break it down. Later started Brent. I'll tell you a little story here. It was kind of funny. And when you think back how much things have changed Yeah. and when he was writing with Barlow and this is going back a, a ways before the oh, yeah. stuff really came out and, and they cut the album with all those songs that Brent did with Barlow. He'd been writing with him for a while and you know how he wrote with him? He's at his house on, in, outside of Martinez on the outskirts there. And do you remember, <laughs> this is, I mean, I don't know how many of the listeners remember the modems, anybody that's my age or a little, even a little bit younger, but the original modems where you took your, your old telephone sure. and you took the handset yeah, and yeah. you put it in a cradle <laughs> and it communicated, and that's what you did. You set it right down inside of a cradle <laughs> and the transmitter and receiver were setting down in there. That's how they, uh, 
Barlow had one of those over in uh, Marin County. Brent wow. had one over there in, in Contra Costa, and that's how they did their songs. Brent would have he'd set his piano, and he had his modem that's right that's there. Gorgeous. And he'd take his cradle, and the first time he showed me that, I'd never seen anything like that. I'm going, oh, my God, that's... I knew there were computers, but he said, watch, I'll get a song. This is, he'll send me some lyrics, you know? <laughs> okay, Barlow. That that's... is total, total bullshit. Okay, well, that's Brent's best friend, Matt Sinclair. He has no reason to lie. So you can, I mean, if that's bullshit, that's bullshit. Well, I, don't, I, I don't know why you tell that story outside of the fact that he's clueless. Okay, so could uh, you, could you, could, so then, nice. so then let's educate, the, then, okay. We always wrote live. We did not try to, to write any other way. Um, yeah, I, at one point, long before I knew him, I had one of those modems with a suction cup. But that was like in 1985. Uh, I didn't start writing with Brent until, I don't know, 89 or 90. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we're talking to John Perry Barlow. John, Brent was dead by 1990. So you started writing with him when he joined the band in 70. I died in July of 1990. We did most of our work between July of 1989 and July of 1990. Um, okay, so Easy to Love You, Far, far who, I mean, when, when, Brent joined the band in 79, so when was the first time you connected with him? Well, we'd done some before that, but. I'm just going to read this again, it says, when Brent was working with Barlow, he, he lived in Martinez, you lived in Marin County. Um, no, I didn't, I They had the original modems where you took an old telephone and the handset and put it in a cradle, and the transmitter no. receiver was down in it. Barlow had one of those over in Marin right. County. Brent would sit at his piano right. and he had his modem right there. He said, watch, I'll get a song. He'll send me some lyrics. You can't tell me that that didn't happen. You're telling me that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Okay, so, Ever. okay, so when was the first, could you just talk uh, the first time you met Brent Midland and what your impression of him was as, as a person and as a player? Oh, I don't know. He, I met him whenever he joined the band it was it was pretty immediate and my impression of him was that he had a a vast reservoir of things to say and very little in the in terms of tools to say them with and that he was he was kind of an instantaneous quarter and I uh, I don't know what took me so long to to ask him to write with me because it it turned out to be a wonderful relationship we both decided we would do it even if we had nothing at stake just because it was fun but we did it together we never did it we never used electronics and and had we done uh, that kind of modem, is something I had for about three months in 1985. So I don't know what he's talking about. Okay. Well, that's, and just for the record, uh, uh, Lisa, his wonderful wife, connected me with Matt Sinclair, who uh, knew Brent since he was a kid. So um, it's all good. I, I, I guess I'm a little bit perplexed, and I think it's important for the record um, Go to Heaven, it was made in 1980, not 1989, 1980, and the credits on Easy to Love You and Far From Me are Barlow Midland. So you were definitely helping him writing songs when he first joined the band. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't really get serious about it until much later. And as I say, I didn't have that modem by then either. Okay, well, don't worry about the modem. Easy to Love You. I mean, can you talk about one of the early songs? You said he didn't have the tools to... He had a lot to express, but he didn't have the tools. And can you talk about an early collaboration that you guys worked on? He had a vocabulary in English of about three or four hundred words. He was a guy who expressed vast, vast art with music. Period. Well, I'd see him. Or more to the point, he'd feel me and write chords around it. 
if you could um, talk to the audience a little bit, um, when I asked you to come on the show, you said, well, I'll do it because nobody knows who he is. Um, what would you, what do you want to let well, people... I, this completely insane story, but I think it's worth telling. Um, presumably came from his best friend, you know, and if, if his best friend is telling stories like that, certainly nobody knows who he is. Actually, I think it's, I mean, whether or not it's, it's, it's an endearing story, truthfully. So, I mean, listen. I, but it's not true. Okay. But you're already That's telling there, me, you, you just, you just it. said that you, you just said you didn't get serious about writing with Brent until he was already almost in his coffin. Okay, and you know what? The same guy that you're calling, the same, the same guy, and I just want to be clear: the same guy, the same guy who 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 may be factually inaccurate, said this about you. He said Brent's funeral was one of the most touching times I have ever spent around the Grateful Dead. All the pallbearers were in the room: the dead and myself. John Barlow came and stepped in and made himself a pallbearer. There was a little room, and during the service part of it, the dead were back there just telling jokes. It was probably nervous humor, but it was incredible and positive vibes for Brent. We were all laughing to keep from crying, probably. Saying goodbye to Brent was the, was the last time I pretty much said goodbye to the Grateful Dead. So you want to talk about being a pallbearer? Can you talk about that day at Brent's funeral? I was supposed to give the eulogy and be a pallbearer, and Weir got very upset about that. He didn't want me to give him eulogy because he was, well, there was a lot of weird blood between between Bobby and I over my relationship with Brent. But um, he usurped the eulogy position at the last minute. But there was never any thought about me not being a father. Right. So could you explain how you even began collaborating with them? Because um, Go to Heaven came out in 1980. Brent was in the band since 79. Clive Davis said that, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, can you explain how you even connected with Brent that you'd even want to work with him? Well, Clive Davis asked me to. Um, he said, we need, we need more Grateful songs on Grateful Dead songs on this record. I think that's what he said. And I said, Well, I don't know how to do that. And he said, Well, you can. everything you've done has been that. And I said, I never, I never thought of it that way. I mean, but anyway, I wrote one for Clive, and then many years later, Brent and I become good friends, and. It just became obvious that he had a lot of stuff he, he wasn't singing, and I had this idea that uh, it turned out to be a crazy idea that uh, the thing inside him that was trying to kill him would back off if he felt like he was getting the credit he deserved from the band and from the fans. But it turned out to be exactly the opposite, uh, as I now understand. I mean, if you have, you know, fatally low self-esteem, uh, bringing a resounding shout of, of uh, slightly thoughtless high esteem from outside it only makes it worse, and it can really dig you in. So it goes, we're making we made since the world began. Nothing more, the love of the women, the love of the men. Seasons round, creatures great and small, up and down. It's a rising fire.
got another voice to play for you here i hope this brings a, a smile to your face uh again uh i'm hoping that it's uh, it's accurate um but uh we'll take a listen and come back this is a good one this is a joke that barlow told me this guy is walking down the street uh busy street downtown and uh he's got a cigar box in his hands and it's all taped up with masking tape it's taped shut and it's making this sound like like that and the guy comes up to him a stranger comes up to him and says hey what's that sound what's in that box and the guy goes it's my bee collection he says bee collection yeah he says I got 10,000 bees right here in this box 100,000 bees right in this box there's 100,000 bees don't they get crushed the guy says fuck them <laughs> it's my collection. I can do anything I want with it. Fuck them. So, in the last couple, David Nelson. you got it, Barlow. Can is did he did he tell the joke correctly? David and I made up that joke. And the thing is, 
I think he made it up, and he thinks I made it up. <laughs> all I all I know is that we were both there the night that it appeared. But it is funny in a dark kind of way. Um, did you feel that? I mean, for somebody that never saw the band, like myself, and the Grateful Dead, born in 1978. Um, was it Brent's self-esteem and insecurity that he didn't feel he got the credit from the band, or was it real that he didn't get credit from the band? You mentioned with Bobby, he all, the band always slighted him because they never thought he was that great a musician. But with Brent, was it more in his head, or was it true that the band did slight him? No, they didn't. He was the only person that they all listened to in the, in the uh, onstage match. They all had in-ear mics, uh, monitors. <laughs> and everybody had a different mix. And many people were basically missing from some other people's mix. Brent was the only person that everybody was listening to. Well, I mean, it means that, that he was what they were queuing on. He was usually important. Right. Um, so could you, I mean, I remember talking to you um, at Harvard maybe 20 years ago, and I said, so did you do most of your writing in, in Wyoming? And you said, no, it was done in Northern California. Um, Yep. What is one memory of of the collab? Could you just paint what? the could you paint the picture of one collaboration that you guys did where that is still in your memory that you still think about? Well, I think about I think about Little Girl Lost practically every day, especially since I had my first uh, granddaughter the day before yesterday. Congratulations. Um, uh, but I that song really appeared to me as I was going up the driveway to his house in its entirety of, you know words naughty line everything I started up that driveway and it was there when I got out of the car and Never had anything like that happen before or since. The song that John Perry Barlow was referring to, Little Girl Lost, uh, was known as I Will Take You Home. But it was uh, yeah, right. Little Girl Lost in a Forest of Dreams. It's a dark old wood and it's damp with dew. Hoot owl hoots. For a moment it seems something big and cold just got a hold of you. Just when everything gets scary... Daddy comes round for his darling again. Hold my hand with your little fingers. Daddy's loving arms going to gather you in. Ain't no way the boogeyman can get you. You can close your eyes. The world is going to let you. Your daddy's here and I'll never forget you. I will take you home. So that came in a spontaneous fashion to you, driving yep. into his house? Yep. With Weir... You talked about was revelatory to me that because he wasn't uh, you, you, a lot of the times the melodies you not only were writing the the lyrics but you were also coming up with the hooks and the grooves and music. Um, Brent was much more melodic and and uh, and more of a, of a musician than Bobby was. How did you guys work? Were you also coming up with the melodies, or was Brent more of the melody guy and you were the word guy? Uh, we were doing it together, but there was never disharmony between us on this. I mean, it just depended who had the best idea. But yeah, I mean, it was. I've often said that writing with Brent was uh, the most intimate thing I ever did for the man. It was a wonderful experience. We used to say that we would we would go on writing songs together if we had no material reason to do so. 
looking back on it, um, can you talk about, because you guys were getting close, getting become very dear friends, um, how his death affected you? And if it was a, I mean, it obviously was a tragedy, but I mean, he, can you just talk about how it, 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 it had, a, it, what it did to you as a, as a human I mean, that that's pretty powerful. The most intimate thing you ever did with a man. Um, you just talk about how that his, his death impacted you. I don't know what to say. Uh, a lot of it is obvious, but uh, at the, when I found out that he was dead, I was doing an interview with John Markoff of the New York Times about computer security. You know, another field that I moved into, and I was kind of moving away from the dead for a bit. And um, he told me what had happened, and I, I just started to cry. And I basically didn't stop crying for a couple of days. And then later, going to the cemetery with uh, Garcia. Um, I said, you know, I've been thinking that I'm the only person that can that can uh, be out front or backstage with equal facility. And I think I'm going to go out front for a while because it's just safer there. And he said, oh, God, man, don't you think that's what I would do? And gave me this stricken look like, there is the one thing I cannot ever do. Did you, I feel like you told me a story about going up to Jerry and saying something like, like you heard him playing a tune and you said, boy, that would be really cool on, on a trumpet. And he looked at you and he said, I play trumpet. No, it was a little more elegant than that. Yeah, no, exactly. Can uh, you please tell me that story? Because I've been like trying, I, it's in my head somewhere. Yeah, I, I, he just discovered MIDI and sampling. And he played half a concert as though he were Miles Davis as well. And uh, I came up to him and I said, you could have been a great trumpet player. <laughs> and he said, I am a great trumpet player. <laughs> That's the story, Barlow. Oh, man. Um. Uh, if I if there was one thing you wanted to tell the audience that nobody really knew about Brent, what would it be? I would tell people to be careful with the folks they revere because they may not be psychologically equipped to be revered. That's what you would want people to know about Brent. Who did he revere and what is that? I mean, you're speaking kind of in... I don't, oh. People were being in. I thought the answer to his problem was that people didn't appreciate him. So I got him into a position where they did. And that only made it worse. Do you believe that he was the greatest keyboardist, being that you were, you knew Pigpen, you knew TC, you knew Keith? Was Brent the best keyboardist of all time in The Grateful Dead? Oh, hell yeah. Why? You know, Big Ben, Big ben wasn't a keyboarder. That's he right. Was a, That's right. He was he was branding, but he was also a great musician, just not necessarily a keyboardist, pure and simple. But you know, Brent, Brent's one of the best musicians. Right? But never mind that. I mean, he just uh, he was a heart wrenching tragedy and a soul lifting joy. Just to, to, a lot of people are tuning in and a lot of feedback and a lot of questions, but I just would like you to uh, let people know how you're, uh, 
how are you feeling and, and, and how inspired are you and what is your next project? Well, I'm still two wheeling and well, I guess four, but <laughs> uh, I'm working on getting up to where I don't need wheels and that's slow and I, I just had another stay in the hospital. It was like to kill me, but uh, I I continue, and I think I'll climb out of this. Eventually. It's been really pretty rugged. Wavy Gravy loves that ergonomic uh, four wheel crafts. Uh, I guess it was was made in Nor uh, Europe somewhere. That 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 scooter. Oh. Uh, Actually made in China, like everything else. Is <laughs> designed by a uh, Dutch person. Um, I just before I let you go, I you know, John, I I, uh, I want to thank you so much. Um, you know, you're. I can uh, tell you. What's that? If you see a question that looks interesting, I can. Well, um, I just kind of wanted you to to. Um, to talk about your concept of love and um I've, I've i've actually connected with my peer group since we last talked i've been interviewing a lot of musicians from the quote unquote jam band circuit and um it's been invigorating to connect with my peer group and a lot of them played a, a concert to raise money for your for your hospital stay and i wanted to know your concept of love and how the community how much love you felt from the community, people like Gerilyn Brandelius, who have been taking care of you and, and really more of a macro thing about how that spreads out to, to all of, of humanity. Well, the, the night I turned sick, uh, I was in fat rush to get to San Francisco so I could spend some time with the only human being I ever met that can seamlessly accept love without resistance. And uh, I believe that's kind of the secret of life. You can train yourself to accept love but the rest of it will take care of itself. But I did get back in time to spend the night up in the lobby of the Mark Hopkins just to uh, And then went home to Palo Alto. And uh, woke up the next day and I had a, I had a joint that was obviously separate. And I went to Stanford and told him and Oh, they say it's not separate. It's just, your, your blood counts right. You don't have a fever. And I said, well, I don't know. I've had this before. But they sent me home, and when I came back around, I, I was dying. And then uh, I had it in four joints. I was, you know, my friend who was of uh, drama medicine in San Francisco in general, which is kind of like being a, an officer in the Viet Cong. Hmm. Uh, she came down and I greeted her by keeping about two pints of blood. And uh, she took me over to Stanford, she insisted they let me in. And they did a lot of really goofy stuff in surgery. Uh, and then it's been just a long, deeply strange trip after that. Did the, did their surgeries, was it malpractice? No, I don't. It was, it was iatrogenic, really. Uh, malpractice has 
has a connotation in town that I don't mean to provide it. No, I just, you I mean, said that they did some funky st- things to you. I just, I mean, it seems like it was well, like. I mean, they made some actions. I mean, and, you know, given that 220,000 people die from iatrogenic accidents in this country every year, that's, that's not so surprising. Gerilyn told me in our interview, she said, I keep reminding Barlow that as he goes through this hardship, that maybe this is all about, maybe this is all a part of you learning how to accept love. Maybe this is a, co- maybe this is a cosmic lesson for you. Learn how to accept love yes, for, well, from other people. Obvious. I mean, you want to learn how to accept love, put yourself in a position where, you know, you have to. Where your survival depends on it. Your brain is still uh, functioning at a high level. What kinds of projects are you doing right now? I mean, can you fill us in on if, aside from preservation? Well, I'm, I just wrote a book. Um, first time I ever did that. And, uh, Can you talk about that? Yeah, it is. I wrote a book. I wrote a book for this. Um, it will probably be disappointing to go to this because uh, that's only a, maybe a quarter of it is thick. I mean, I've lived this really astonishing life. I don't like the thinking man's forest down. <laughs> Yeah. You've never you've it's amazing you've never you've published so many articles but you've never written a book. Well, somebody helped me by basically forcing me to do it. And in my various medical tours, I I kind of lost the ability to type and. Uh, so I had somebody else type me as I as I said it, and then brushing it up. What is the name of the book? Well, that's that's up for grabs at the moment, but probably uh, Mother American Night. Mother American Night. Yeah. Can you explain the significance of that, or is that just riffing off the top? What is that about? It's from a song I wrote. Um, Black, black-throated wind. Black-throated wind. I just want to tell you, Barlow, you have no idea. Just let it grow. How did – let it grow. I listen to that tune with my younger – both daughters every day, the live version of it. Wow. It is the most powerful song. I mean, I, I'll be honest. With you, I mean, Jerry's tunes are amazing, are the, are great, but I, I mean, let it grow, man. Can you talk about the uh, where that song came from? I, I, it, it is the greatest tune. In the you know, out of all the collaborations, I just I, I can I can't stop listening to this one live version of it, and it's just it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I said, I just would love to know the, the germination of the seeds of that tune. I was irritating. We were talking up and said that they were, that they were going to go in the studio. And this was after a fairly serious hiatus. And he said, we need a song. To, I need a song today. Um, what can you do? And I said, well, I need to spread wire today. So I'll see if I can come up with something while I'm doing that. So it starts out with mosquitoes. It goes from there. Did you have a hand in writing throwing stones, too? I wrote throwing stones. Right. Uh, 
Weir, Weir's response to me in our interview was, I have no idea where that song came from, but um, could you? Well, I mean, maybe not because it came from me. <laughs> well, every I mean, listen, I just, I mean, it's true. Like estimated profit, man. One of the jazziest tunes, and that those melodies, those hooks, that's all you're in your from your head, right? I just want to be clear about that. Yeah. Oh, this is unbelievable. But I'm just, with the with the throwing stones, um. You know, politicians in their summer homes was that creeping in during the Carter years, Nixon years, or was that a direct response to Reagan? Well, that's actually, that's actually a line that Bobby did write. <laughs> so he did write it. All right, so he did write that line. But, I mean, what, what was the, what were you seeing at that time? We've gotten to a point today where, I mean, ashes, ashes all fall down. I mean, you know, you could make a state. We've never been in, in more of a democratic crisis than we are today. I don't know how you feel about that, but I just don't know what you were seeing then that was so, those lyrics hold up better today than they did then. Well, it's been true for a long time. It's just getting more true. Just wanted to ask you about uh, somebody who is a, uh, follows my uh, posts quite a bit on Facebook. Uh, you just talk about the, the importance of having Gerilyn Brandelius in your life over the last few years? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm glad she's so periodically appears about this. I have to go off for a bit. Would you, would you still be alive if she wasn't with you every day? Well, you know, given the precariousness of my life, just a little outside, but I think so. Yeah, there are a few people here that unquestionably saved my life. Can but you? I wouldn't count Joe. There's one of them, but she's she's certainly incredibly devoted, and I really am very grateful for it. It's really uh, a great source of joy. And uh, I just would like you to talk about um, how your daughters have helped you stay inspired and... and They're just critical. I stay alive for them and for my new grand person. And it uh, kind of goes out from there. Uh, do we have any idea when the book is going to come out? Oh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Next year. Sometime. When was the last, do you, do you have, do you ever talk to Brent? Do you ever get it? Is he ever in your mind? Oh, I don't. Yeah, he's on my mind a lot, but I don't, I don't like converse with his soul or anything. <laughs> Uh, I hope you, uh, um, over time, um, uh, uh, continue to, to improve and, uh, and I appreciate that, uh, hope you appreciate that there are peeps out there like me who are, who are, uh, looking to just shed the light on, uh, the people's history of music and, and whatnot. So, um, uh, you know, have a wonderful day, man. And, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Later. John Perry Barlow, rather tight-lipped today, but uh, we did get some information out of him. Uh, we'll be back uh, uh, next. Uh, we'll be back on Monday with Justin. Clinton.